Welcome back, everybody, for our third week uh, weekly update. Uh, we're doing these uh, weekly now. We've had a great response from everyone, um, especially on the replays. And more and more people have been uh, registering for these. Um, and uh, hopefully we're going to get better at them as we go along here. The uh, Just a couple of housekeeping things. I hope everyone enjoyed the music. We just uh, we got some comments of the... the as people sign in, not uh, not sure if it's the right one. So if you caught on with the uh, the playlist there, I did not create it, uh, but obviously all very themed to the times that we're having these days. Uh, as mentioned, we will have uh, this posted for replay. Um, we also have it on YouTube. I've been asked a couple times from uh, from different uh, different sources. Uh, can they share this invite? Can they share the replays? By all means, yes. Uh, in fact, uh, we now have our YouTube channel up and running. It does take a day or so to get the replay up on YouTube, but uh, we will send out the link for the replay of this and, and all our webinars as we go along. We're trying to, uh, the theme of these are, are the weekly updates are just to keep everyone informed. Obviously, information's moving quickly and uh, just be able to stay apprised of uh, what we're seeing out there and what we're seeing in, in the, the portfolios. Um, we are doing another one. I did a, uh, a, tax, a, uh, a tax seminar, a uh, live one uh, in March. We had many people, uh, many people attend who have been coming to these. I am gonna record that as well because I know a lot, uh, we had a lot of interest in people who couldn't make it that night. So I'll record one of those and we'll send that link out. And that's just with tax tip, tax tip for 2020. I will update it because there's awfully, obviously been a lot of changes with the stimulus package to the, uh, the tax reporting for this year and how that might play out. Sorry, a little technical difficulty. Uh, for those of you who are new to us, uh, I am Michael LeBlanc. I'm a director uh, at uh, Canaccord Genuity Wealth Management and a portfolio manager. And uh, we are uh, running uh, wealth for individuals and business owners uh, across Canada. I've moved this slide up. It was at the, la the end of our last uh, few uh, updates. Um, legally, we Obviously, they have to have a disclaimer, so just wanted to put it up front here. Uh, the information that we're presenting to you today is changing so rapidly. We try to get the most current information, but of course, um, do double check things uh, before, you, uh, before you act on them. And again, we're not given specific advice here for any individual. This is broad-based uh, information. Uh, in our first webinar, we did talk about the process to make sure you uh, go through a proper financial plan and assess your risk and what's appropriate for you. So make sure you do get advice from your advisor or if you want one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, information, please reach out to us. We'd be happy to share that with you. And again, on the technology front, uh, for questions, on your side of the screen, if you move your mouse near the bottom, you should have a pop-up toolbar. And in the middle there, there's a little Q and A icon. Uh, if you click on there, you'll get a, a text box where you can write us a text, uh, type out your question. I'll, uh, I'll try to get to them all at the end. Last week, I ran a little bit long, so we reached out to people afterwards and, and covered them off. Uh, but I'll try to get to most of them at the end. Uh, and then you can always email myself or Sophia or Luby uh, to ask any questions or to set up a private, uh, a private call or video conference. Uh, just to see, uh, just to the left of the Q&A, there's a little raise your hand um, icon there. Uh, you can raise your hand if you have a specific question that you want me to look at right away. Uh, by all means, you can use that. It will, uh, it will pop up on my screen here and I will uh, try to address them as we go along. So before we get started today, I did want to just talk a little bit about um, what's going on in the world in general. I mean, of course, uh, we hear a lot of the news about the people in the front lines, and, and we do want to recognize how important they are, uh, not just the medical uh, staffs and the hospitals and the doctors, uh, there's the people who work in the uh, supply chain, food distribution, uh, the truck drivers uh, who are getting the, uh, getting the goods to us, uh, the delivery people, the list goes on and on. Um, but one of the areas that are, are suffering a lot right now is the charities. And I wanted to recognize one in particular is the food banks. 
This is one I quite like uh, in BC, uh, Vancouver here. They, uh, they, they have a very, they've been in operation since the 80s. Uh, they serve uh, the greater Vancouver, but they also support other food banks in the, in the smaller communities. I uh, just want to highlight, this is not just affecting, what we're seeing in our, uh, our daily lives these days is not just affecting the part-time workers or the young. It's amazing how broad base uh, the, the work layoffs and the, uh, the interruption in daily lives is happening. I think the food banks are going to be put under a lot of pressure in the coming months. Uh, so if you can help, you can donate online. Um, if you want to, uh, you can easily search for uh, maybe a community-based food bank in your area that you want to, uh, to support or any other charities that are helping people get through this time. It is going to be difficult, uh, and um, I, I do recommend it. I've, uh, I've started to take the money that I usually spend on my uh, lunches every week, uh, being in the office, which I haven't been doing, and redirecting that to the food bank. Any little bit helps, and uh, it will go a long way for people who need it. So let's get right into it. Uh, the agenda that we're going to follow is pretty much the same every week. We're going to talk about COVID and where things are at. Uh, we're going to look at the markets and what's going on, uh, where things are at today, or as updated as we can be, and then what's next. How can we, uh, how can we react to that in our portfolios and what opportunities are there? So I'll take you through these three again this week. So the, again, the three things that we're looking at with COVID is uh, how controllable or how much can we flatten the curve uh, and, and where are things at like currently. What's happening with the fiscal and mon monetary uh, changes that we're seeing in, around the world, but specifically we're looking at the US and Canada, and where are we at um, vaccine, or really what we're looking at is treatments uh, along the way. Obviously the outbreak uh, continues. These are the latest numbers from this morning. They're constantly changing, but uh, these from about 10 o'clock this morning. As you can see, uh, the world, we're almost at 1.4 million uh, infected, um, or originally infected, but we do have almost 300,000 recovered. The USA continues to expand. It's expanding at quite, uh, quite a rapid rate, almost 20,000 uh, a day, uh, based on the testing that they're doing. Uh, obviously, uh, the government in the US is now giving out estimates between one and 240,000. Uh, I'm not sure how accurate those are as far as the expected uh, death rate, uh, but it is expanded and we do expect that to affect things further in the, in the U.S. Spain and Italy uh, continue to grow. Italy's actually started to plateau, um, which is a good sign. Uh, Spain has, uh, has been uh, spiking and catching up and passing Italy, Italy and the infected, but not quite on the total deaths. Canada's holding strong. We've seen a couple of days where it spiked, uh, but still in the flattening of the curve type of uh, numbers. And uh, so far the hospitals have been able to keep up. So hopefully that continues for us here in Canada. But really what we're looking at is, is what, what's gonna come out of this or where are we gonna see things come? So China is a great uh, way for us to get a little bit of insight into that. Uh, there is a lot of questions around their numbers, um, on the number infected and the total death. But one thing, uh, so we can't entirely trust the, the, the number, but when we look at time and we do see uh, China getting back to work, um, there is some concern around uh, reinfections, but so far uh, we've not seen uh, a, a massive spike, um, a, few, a few cases here and there. Uh, but for the most part, the uh, supply chain in, the, in China and the manufacturing is starting to pick up. We're starting to see them import again, uh, from the U.S. Uh, and, and and starting to to grow the grow the manufacturing sector and also supply in other countries. Canada starting to import um, different items from uh, from China as well. So that's a good sign that they've come out of it. It gives us a little bit of a window into where North America will, will be headed and how soon. Um, on, as far as the forecasts go, we covered last week talking about the decline in the GDP. Uh, we are expecting to go into recession. Uh, the harder hit areas we're, we're really watching is the small and medium sized businesses, uh, how they're going to be able to come out of this. Um, they're dealing with a lot of, right now, obviously, the shutdowns of their businesses, uh, managing their staff, whether to, to lay off or to maintain. Um, 
and what type of stimulus packages uh, they're receiving and how to best use those. And we're gonna go into the stimulus package a little bit more. Uh, but we do expect that, that recession. We don't expect a depression at this point, uh, but def definitely recession is the likely outcome we have here. Uh, for those who've just joined us, uh, again, if you wanna answer any questions, just go to the Q&A bar uh, at the bottom of your screen. Yeah, I think you have to shake your mouse over top of it and you can just type in your question. So let's talk about where we are today. So the markets, as far as the markets went last week, we did see them slip uh, for most of last week. The previous week were positive, negative last week. And uh, of course, we've seen a couple of good days uh, this week. Uh, and that's uh, where that trend will continue. Uh, we'll get into a little bit more detail, but uh, we don't expect this rally, uh, this week's rally to hold, uh, mainly because we really haven't seen any changes. Uh, in fact, the, the only news or economic news that we've seen come out is um, the unemployment rate. And of course, last Friday, the numbers in the U.S. shot up to 6.6 million, uh, the largest jump we've, we've ever seen down there. Um, and in Canada as well, the numbers have been drastically high. So with all the unemployment, even with the stimulus packages, uh, we don't see anything to really uh, cause the, the markets to rally uh, on a permanent level. There is some trading that we're doing into this market. Um, but very, uh, very short term based on uh, rallies and um, kind of buying on, buying on pullbacks and selling into um, up, up days because uh, they're not really holding on that upside. Uh, in the US, um, as we mentioned, the, the job markets came out. Uh, they, they not only layoffs, but the, the number of jobs in March uh, dropped drastically. Uh, Google is... Uh, really leveraging their data management to come out with some working data on, uh, on, on what happens and the trends and the time as far as uh, the COVID is going to go through our economies. Uh, so we're keeping a good close eye on that. Amazon has delayed their prime day, uh, at least until August. This is the big sale day they do once a year. Uh, this is really gonna affect their inventory movement uh, and, and will probably hit their earnings uh, quite uh, quite a bit. Uh, and they've also, um, their prime delivery, the two day delivery has, uh, has not, they, they've pushed that out. Uh, and in Canada, I think most of it is uh, pushed out a couple of weeks. Uh, and in the US, it's dependent on the product and location. So uh, we'll expect to see some uh, pullback in their earnings. FedEx is raising cash. They've, they've tapped into a 1.5 billion credit line. Uh, and this is due to the amount of demand that they're having on their, their express delivery, uh, which is lucrative for them, but is also very expensive. So they're really tapping their cash reserves to make sure they can continue that, so that service. Canada has been in an argument with uh, the US. This is an example of uh, trying to stay on top of the news with 3M, which 3M is one of the companies we actually hold in the portfolios these days. Uh, on mask, uh, the, the government in the U.S. has uh, tried to block 3M delivering any mask outside of the U.S. and specifically to Canada. However, they did come to an agreement uh, just uh, last night that 3M will be delivering medical masks to, to Canada um, because they are not manufactured in the U.S. They're actually manufactured overseas, so uh, they, will be, uh, they will be delivered to Canada's medical teams. In Canada, the big banks have received almost a half a million uh, mortgage deferral requests. So this is one of the stimulus um, items that the government has uh, asked the banks to do, and this allows people to uh, defer their mortgage payments if their income is being affected. I do caution this, uh, you know, if you know, so if you're looking at doing this or you know someone who is, do be careful because one thing to keep in mind is the payment is deferred, but the interest is compounded. So at the end of the day, you're, you're, you're paying more to the bank. So um, where you'd normally make your mortgage payments and at the end of the year, uh, you get a statement showing that you've actually paid down some of the principal and of course all the interest for the year. Uh, very likely if you take the, uh, the full five months, I think it is, uh, deferral uh, at the end of this year, uh, your mortgage could go up in, in total value uh, versus the end of last year, depending on how, uh, how big the mortgage is and what your payments were, uh, because the, uh, the interest will com compound over that time period. The banks, I mean, it's great for the banks. They're not losing money. It's just delaying when, when they'll get the money, but they will get more in the end. 
Uh, China has not resumed uh, imports from Canada yet, especially in the canola, uh, where they had suspensions in place prior to this, um, but we're, uh, we're looking for that to change. The, uh, the U.S. Uh, monetary uh, program and the, uh, the Canadian, when it comes to uh, the benefits uh, for unemployed workers or uh, workers who's, uh, for companies whose workers uh, aren't obviously working right now, uh, would help compensate. The one thing to keep uh, in mind, uh, it, may, it may generate the, not the behavior that we want. Basically because uh, it may be better to lay people off and have the government pay them versus the company. It might end up cheaper. Um, so the company might actually put more of the burdens onto the governments as opposed to uh, fielding it themselves. The other thing to keep in mind here, and we're going to go into more detail in this, but um, one of these, these loan programs to companies to help uh, from the government to help them get through this time, um, you know, the companies have to pay that back. So depending on how long it is before the companies get back up and running again, before the revenues turn or return to normal uh, and how much profit margin they make um, when they do return to normal, they're going to have strap a payment on top of their current operating costs. Uh, and that might, you know, they might make it through this, but not be able to pay those loans or it might put undue burden on the companies to try to pay those loans and force them into uh, bankruptcy anyway. So, uh, so there is, there is good and there's bad to, things to keep in mind with the stimulus packages. Um, but um, uh, we are going to do actually a specific uh, webinar just for business owners on how it affects them and how they can prepare their business for this and how to prepare their business to come out of this at the end. Uh, because there is a lot of ins and outs into it. Um, with the stimulus packages to who gets the money, uh, whether in the U.S. or Canada, um, it, it's really going to be an interesting thing to watch to what sectors and which companies are going to benefit from the credit package or what some people call a bailout package. Uh, it's kind of uh, a triage of who needs it first and who needs it most. Uh, we're going to have to keep a very, very close eye on that as we go through. Uh, the dairy farmers, I don't know if uh, anyone has been uh, following this, but the dairy farmers have been in trouble. Uh, despite there being a large demand in the, in the supply chain, um, there is excess, excess dairy right now. Uh, we have also seen it in the um, agriculture. Uh, there was a report out on potatoes um, just being dumped. Same with the, the, the milk is being, is being dumped. Uh, without the restaurants operating, um, there's just an excess. It's not being consumed at home as much as we, uh, we would have when we, when we uh, go out uh, to eat versus uh, stay, staying in. So that's going to affect the dairy, which was already uh, under a lot of pressure from the uh, trade war with China. So uh, we'll have to see how that plays out. It's another area of the market that we're keeping an eye on. And of course, the benefits package in Canada went live yesterday. For everybody who's born in January, February, March, and then today, um, April, May, June, and, and so forth. So they had over a million applicants yesterday to apply to the program. Uh, it is cost in Canada $71 billion, and, and with a government that already was running a $22 billion deficit for 2020, uh, this is really going to impact, uh, when we come out of this, the, our taxation uh, and our total debt for the, for the uh for the country and the, the federal debt. Uh, we're also seeing the provinces under a lot of pressure for their stimulus packages. Ontario uh, was, was already um, had a very tight budget uh, because of their own, their, the debt they're carrying. Newfoundland uh, was already in trouble with debt. And of course, Alberta uh, was being very aggressive with their uh, financial packages prior to this. And with oil, uh, the trouble oil prices has given them. Um, is definitely going to have a challenge. So we're watching the, the debt levels very closely and how that's going to play out as far as the, uh, the economies go. Uh, so will this help? Uh, that's actually a good question. The, the package is definitely going to be a temporary relief, relief for a lot of people in the short period. But in the long period, uh, we're really going to have to weigh the pros and cons of the excess debt and the taxation. Uh, and we'll uh, keep an eye on that as we see how much money is being rolled out. Uh, as far as when the money is going to start to flow, it is flowing. They're saying 10 days to, uh, to get it to, out to people once they apply. 
so we should be seeing that quickly. Uh, there is, uh, if you have lost your job, can, you know, will it help you or how will you, can you apply for this? Uh, it's pretty easy from what I've understood. Um, uh, people go online. Uh, you do have to submit proof of income because you did have to be earning at least $5,000 in the last year, uh, or at least in the last three months to qualify. So if you weren't working last year, you can't just go, uh, apply this year and, uh, uh, and then all of a sudden collect it. Uh, it is for those who have lost wages um, and companies can qualify if the, or the company's income has dropped more than 30% uh, as for subsidies to help their, um, their employees. Um, cheaters or people looking to scam the system. The government is trying to be very diligent and they're, uh, they are talking about some very harsh uh, penalties for anyone who does try to take advantage of this. Obviously, that's a risk uh, when you roll out a program like this on in such a short period of time. It's uh, it's difficult to um, get a program up and running, get the system up and running, and then get the money to people without some people slipping through the cracks. Uh, but they will be looking very closely at who and how um, through the process and any cheaters. Um, there will be some, um, or they're promising some very hefty fines and penalties. The community is actually, uh, the business community is actually mixed on it. As I mentioned, uh, we are, uh, we are going to do a special webinar just for them, uh, for all the ins and outs, because there is so many pieces uh, and they are moving um, almost on a daily, certainly on a weekly basis uh, as to how it's going to impact businesses. Uh, and, and that's when we're, we're really going to work closely with the business leaders to, uh, to get a better understanding. So where, what do we do next? Where are we? I mean, for investors, it's, uh, it's a scary time. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot of fear in the market. Uh, people, we're seeing some people losing faith in the market. It does remind me of, of 2008, 2009, um, when people uh, just got a sense of the market's not for them. Someone want to cash out their investments. And that's where we see the big down days is where just people give up and just uh, want to walk away and, and worry about retirement. Um, and that's normal. Uh, I think uh, what you really want to do is talk to your advisor. If they haven't contacted you, they should. I mean, uh, we're doing these weekly, plus we're on the phone with, uh, with our clients um, on a regular daily basis. We're talking to, uh, to many different clients. Uh, just to keep them informed, uh, your, your advisor, and this is, this is really when your advisor becomes very important. During, during a full steam bull market, um, your advisor's work is pretty easy because everything's going up and everyone's happy. Um, but where your advisor really uh, brings you value is, is when the markets get tough or when they can protect the portfolio on the downside. And that's exactly what, uh, what the, you, should, you should be doing uh, and working with your advisor in that sense. Because really the investments when it comes to your plan, and we talked about the importance of this plan, the investments are a very small piece of that. And many of you in the call have heard me say this before is when we're building the plan, the investment side is actually very easy once we identify all the other pieces and what we're trying to get those investments to do. Um, this is a sample full financial plan uh, that we look at. So you, really when you look at that big picture, uh, the investment side of things are very small uh, components. Uh, and if, they're, if the plan is well vetted, uh, the investment risk will have matched and uh, matched your plan and will get you through these periods of time. The financial plans we do uh, generally take into account 20 to 30 years of, of financial needs. So while we do go through these periods of time on random basis, so as mentioned, we had one in 08, uh, 2016 wasn't a, a great year for the markets. Uh, obviously 2001's crash. Uh, when we do these plans, we'll be taking that into account. So we, uh, this does not affect the long term. And to keep that course, stay calm, stay true to your plan is very, very important uh, when in, you're investing in the markets and uh, keeping, keeping that risk in mind. Uh, we all suffer from uh, that straight line of what success should look like uh, in your portfolios or in your financial plan. Uh, and that's really our, our hindsight uh, default view. 
Uh, I always like to uh, equate it to uh, when people buy their house. Many people might have bought their house 10, 20 years ago, you know, for as little as 100,000 or less. Uh, and they look at it now and, and, and see the values of million, two, three, four million dollars. Uh, and we just look at that from a hindsight view as a straight line up. Of course, that's not what happens. Um, it's never a straight line up. There are some uh, spikes up, there's some spikes down, there's some flat periods. Uh, and that's the same as a, portf a well-managed portfolio. Uh, we'll have a, some ups and downs, but it will always stay within uh, a, a bandwidth of tolerance for, you, for your financial plan or for your risk. So success really is the other picture there. Um, it's never a straight line, but as long as you're always headed in the right direction, uh, you'll be fine. So just want to express the importance of the plan and sticking, sticking with the long-term strategy. Uh, and, and if you want to review yours, please reach out. If you, uh, we have a lot of new people on the call today. Uh, if you don't have one or you want to review yours from someone else, we'd be happy to look at that as well. So I brought up 2008 a few, few times. So what did it look like really uh, taking away, you know, not really looking at the numbers, but if we see where the downturn in the market happens uh, and we started to see the stimulus package kicking in, um, you can see there was a little bit of rallies when they, um, when they were announced. And I'm going to try to highlight that here. If I can do it right here, they were announced, kind of seen it come out, uh, and then it fell again. And that's that pullback. We do expect that pullback. And then we announced this even more when they were going to bail out the auto sector. And then uh, we saw it rally on that news. And of course, the pullback again. Uh, because uh, the stimulus package does take time to get through the economy before it really starts to uh, affect things in the long term. And then here, right at the bottom, we had Obama come out and say, it, the stocks are looking like a good deal. Uh, I'm going to have to get him on the phone and ask him if he can time that again for us because it was almost perfect. And then we saw things start to move up. We saw a little bit more stimulus uh, coming through and we saw the market start to improve. And then we saw companies, and, and if you've listened to the last, um, the last couple, I mentioned, uh, you know, worried about the airlines having to file for bankruptcy or Chapter 11 protection, which is what GM and uh, some automakers did at this point. Um, that's actually a sign of things coming out when we see those things. And, and I know that the, uh, the market uh, did pull back there a little bit. But, uh, but that was just because people got a little, a little bit of fear in them because they thought, oh, what's next? But that means that the companies actually, hey, <clears throat> this is what happened. This is where we are. If we want to move forward, we have to take this next step. And as we saw, the markets kind of pulled forward from there uh, and entered a pretty good period of market, uh, of bull market returns for, uh, for many years to come after that. Some even say until now although we did have a couple of pullback years along the way. So let me turn this little thing off. Uh, no, no, no. Um, so where are we on the graph today? Uh, we're just at the beginning of the stimulus going into the market. So uh, that's why when I, I mentioned, well, I don't think we're at the worst of the, of the pullbacks yet, uh, or at least we might retest the bottom we've already been to. Uh, weeks like this week where we're seeing rallies up. I'm, I'm not uh, not really advising people or uh, recommending jumping back in the market just yet. Uh, if you want to take advantage of some good days, uh, by all means, but to keep in mind your long-term risk. Uh, what we're also seeing, we've seen this many times before in these types of uh, corrections, is the end of passive investing. Maybe not the end, but certainly less, less popular. What we've seen in the bull market over the last few years is what we call passive investing. And this is just buying an index, a mutual fund or an ETF that uh, just mimics the market. So the TSX, for example, or the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ. Uh, and you really don't have to make any great picks because if the, the underlying indexes are climbing, you can climb along at that rate uh, without, uh, without taking any uh, particular sectors into account or um, any specific bets on a particular name. Uh, but what happens in these markets is those indexes take the biggest hits. 
and they take longer to recover because as we mentioned in previous weeks, the recovery is gonna come in certain sectors first. So areas that are least hit, whether it be um, grocery supply chains, transportation of those goods, um, you know, there's, there's, there's talk a little about the medical field, you know, whoever is going to develop uh, the, the treatments or cures for this. Uh, and also in your power companies that continue to supply electricity. Anything that uh, we don't see drop in income, they're going to come back for us. And that's not going to be a big part of the indexes, especially in Canada. The Canadian index is almost 50% uh, energy, oil and gas. Uh, and that's, that's probably not going to be one of the first sectors to come back, not only because we have the price war with uh, Russia and Saudi going on um, oil front, even if they solve that and they are supposedly in talks to solve that, um, that will improve the situation, but no one's out on the road, no one's using it, no one's flying, which is a big user uh, of the energy sector. Uh, so it's going to be a while before demand really catches back up again. So, um, Passive investing is not the best uh, strategy in these types of markets, what we call active investing. And that's whether your ETF or mutual fund has an active manager behind it, trying to take advantage of that, uh, those sectors, or you work directly with a portfolio manager or advisor uh, who can uh, guide your portfolio uh, into the specific areas that we see uh, um, recovering the quickest, the quickest through this. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind when, uh, when investing into these markets is uh, which areas uh, do well. Uh, sometimes it's called growth versus value, uh, large versus small. Uh, and this is just simply the, the type of selections you're making. So when we look at a growth market, a market, market that is rapidly growing uh, with a healthy economy, the, uh, what we call small cap or small capital companies, uh, the smaller ones, uh, do better because they have the most, uh, most room to grow, right? A very large mature, mature company, um, you know, might grow by 10%, 6%, 5%, 5 very healthy growth for those companies. Uh, but a small company can grow by 20, 30, hundred uh, percent, you know, if in the right area, the right niche with the right products. So uh, when we're seeing a market like this though, where capitalization is difficult. So, you know, get in loans, uh, to grow uh, because it does cost money to grow, whether you're expansion, expanding manufacturing or opening new stores or bringing on new employees, you need access to capital. And that's been turned off right now. Um, so where the growth and where the bounce back happens the most is in the larger companies or that value invested is going for the big companies that have been hit hard, who have a lot of cash in the bank, they have steady cash flows and their debt is, uh, is well financed out through this. So uh, do look at the larger companies over the smaller, medium-sized companies uh, when you're looking to jump back in. There will be a time when the small and medium will be a good buy, uh, but not at the start. Generally, we don't see it at the start because they can't, uh, they can't finance that growth. Last week, uh, we covered off some, uh, some ideas, uh, different names in, in multiple sectors. Uh, this week, I wanna talk a little bit about the sectors themselves and also analyst reports. So um, be cautious, as I mentioned about the sector, uh, you know, one that comes up on my, my screen a lot, especially in weeks like this, where we see the, uh, the bounce back. And I, as I mentioned last week, uh, this is really a speculative rally. So people are just jumping in to names that were doing well prior to this, this, um, this the pullback or the COVID uh, problems that we're seeing in our economy. Uh, and, and buying them up, thinking they were good before, they should be good now. Uh, and REITs is one to really, really, really watch because there is absolutely no economic reason that REITs should be rallying right now. Uh, almost across the board, whether you're talking about residential, um, retail, or commercial, um, the, in a lot of cases, the rents are not being paid. Uh, the, the renter on the residential side is, is definitely struggling. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, rents being deferred, so there's no income coming in uh, for, those, for those companies. Uh, on the retail front, of course, we have a lot of chains uh, that are completely closing down. Here in BC, of course, the Steve Naff Gyms was one of the first ones to shut their doors. So all, that, that all their, their locations are no longer paying uh, any lease. Uh, we've seen in the U.S. the Cheesecake Factory, uh, Loblaws announced over the weekend that they're talking to their, their property 
owners to um, to defer their payments or to, to not make the payments. So, uh, and, and the same is going to be for businesses. So the commercial space, the one that may maybe is slightly better, the industrials, uh, you know, your warehouses and manufacturing. Uh, but even there, we're going to we are going to see uh, shutdowns. So the REIT sector um, has no no real economic reason for rally and yet it is so be very careful the sectors that you're looking at as i mentioned before we do like the consumer staple area um, financials we find them a, a good value uh, there's still probably some volatility to see in there um, you know the ones that i don't have uh, on uh, on the list i think is uh, mastercard and visa they actually fall under technology um, because uh, that's all they are. They, they, they faci facilitate the transaction. They do not um, own the debt. That debt is owned by the banks, and they don't collect the interest. So a lot of the banks in Canada here have cut their interest rates on all the credit cards in half to help people through this. Uh, that does not affect Visa and MasterCard. All they do is collect every time you tap or swipe. Um, they collect a fee, and more and more we are doing that because, uh, of course, no one wants to handle cash these days and uh, all the online uh, buying that's happening, which was happening before. It's just accelerating even more through this crisis. So uh, so we do like those. Uh, your utilities, uh, of course, are good. Uh, people are still paying power, even though their uh, BC Hydro here has uh, extended the ability for credits, uh, a one-time credit on your bill. Uh, if you can prove need. Uh, so there will be a little bit of hit to revenue, but not very much. Uh, and the demand will continue on. Um, same with the, the, the telecoms. More and more people are using um, telecommunications, uh, their home Wi-Fi's. Uh, a lot of people have been uh, up in their bandwidths and speeds for the homes uh, because, uh, because of need for, for things like this. So be very cautious of the sectors that you're looking at. Uh, same goes in the US. Uh, and you, as I mentioned, consumer discretionaries versus consumer staples. Uh, I like the staples, uh, Procter and Gamble, um, and Johnson and Johnson. I know it falls under healthcare, but uh, they have a lot of soaps and, and, and home products as well. Just like Procter and Gamble, I like them both. Uh, Coca Cola, consumer discretionaries. A lot of people have been talking about Amazon. That more and more people buy on Amazon because I mentioned earlier today. Uh, you know, they are not without struggle as well through this. Uh, and also, uh, if you follow the news quite a bit, uh, Amazon's had a little trouble with their employees uh, over the safety of the, uh, of the warehouses and the um, social distancing at the warehouses. So things to keep in mind there. Uh, technology, Apple, Microsoft, I continue to like, um, you know, all of the, they, they have seen a pullback as well. Apple's been a bit more volatile, mostly because it had such a good run up last year. Uh, a little bit of that, uh, a little bit of those gains are being taken off the table. But uh, all in all, both of those, uh, again, are getting boosted as more and more people go online, more and more people are using softwares and, and hardware. Uh, and uh, I don't think that's going to end as we come out of this. I think people are learning new ways of doing things that is going to translate into uh, a change going forward. Uh, on the utility fronts, uh, again, in the U.S., we, we like it. Uh, real estate in the U.S., same idea as Canada, although American Towers is a slightly different one. Uh, that one specifically owns the towers for the, the cell phones uh, and also 5G. So as that expands, um, we do like that one as a pick in the U.S. Uh, again, we're not jumping in quite yet, but it is one to keep an eye on. Um, always remember your diversification. Just because things are down does not mean to not sell anything. Uh, move out of the sectors that uh, you don't feel are appropriate uh, to come out of this and have the cash available to move into areas that are gonna, going to give you the best returns the, the quickest as we see re recoveries coming through, um, through this market. So keep that in mind. Keep diversified. Um, depending on how much capital you have to deploy, I use ETFs and in our portfolios, we actually use ETFs quite a bit. Um, we have individual name portfolios for, for larger portfolios and, and smaller portfolios like TOSAs uh, or people building. We, uh, we use the ETFs. Uh, I don't like the broad-based ETFs, the, the, the TSX, especially in this type of market. 
Uh, do look at specific if, if you want a little bit more broad. There's the TSX 60, which looks at the largest 60 companies in Canada. Uh, you will get some energy exposure in that, but uh, but it, 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 it is the larger companies in the energy sector. So if any one of those are going to come back sooner, it will be those. Uh, you can go very specific by sector with DTF, whether you want exposure into utilities, into financials, uh, into specific countries. Um, do you use the more sector specific exposures with the ETF as opposed to the broad ones in this type of market? But they're just as powerful as individual names. Uh, and in some cases, they make a lot more sense because you can, you can maintain your diversification a lot better uh, than individual names if you don't have a lot of capital to deploy um, or a larger portfolio to deploy it in. Uh, we're just a bit about Canaccord. Uh, we are a, a global firm, uh, Canada being our, our, our origins, uh, but we are in Australia. We have a large wealth footprint there. In the UK, we have actually bigger than Canada now uh, um, exposure, uh, and we're able to draw on all that uh, research and abilities uh, from around the world uh, to deliver that to you uh, here today. Um, I do want to mention, I brought up earlier on the analyst front, if any of you follow any analyst and uh, track their recommendations, I do cautious you, cautious, I always caution people on analysts, not because they're bad or they're doing anything uh, unethical, uh, but they always work on assumptions. So the way they model up a company is, um, you know, how much business they're doing today, how much revenue they're doing today, and what assumptions they have for the coming three months, six months, one year, two years, three years, and where they think that will go. Right now, they're very challenged, which is kind of why I wanted to bring this up, is uh, they do not have a clear picture of where things are going. Uh, so those are assumptions that are very difficult to build. So that's why in all the recommendations that we talk about here, it's, uh, it, it's focused on, on steady cash flow, not counting on, on new cash flows or growing cash flow, uh, looking at business who uh, continue to have that cash flow uh, through this crisis because um, we don't know exactly how things are gonna uh, come out and how quickly they're gonna come out of this. So it's, it's a little difficult for them to come up with really good est estimates these days. So do be careful of that. Uh, but uh, all in all, if you have any questions, if you've read a report that you want to you, you want to ask or double check about, by all means, be happy to review it for you and give you give you an opinion on it. So I'm going to jump to uh, jump to questions here. We have a few coming through the queue. Um, are there one of them? Are there government relief programs in place for seniors uh, whose investment income has dropped? Uh, not as not as of yet. Um, it's a great question though. Uh, we have not seen anything on that front. Um, hopefully, if your portfolio is uh, diversified really well, um, you should have some cash in there. So if you're if you're pulling off uh, off that cash, it's it's not affecting your overall portfolio because you're not having to sell into the down market um, or in, into this uh, pullback, and so it shouldn't affect your long term. Uh, the government did reduce the required uh, withdrawals from RIFs for seniors by 25%. Uh, and that's a good idea. Uh, it does lend uh, people the ability to say, hey, I am going to reduce my spend in. I'm going to leave some extra cash in the portfolio uh, to help uh, to jump on some opportunities uh, and, and have it recover more quickly when, uh, when we get through this. So, um, so that's, that's all we've seen on the relief programs as far as the seniors go. Um, but if you have some specific concerns around your, your, your portfolio and your income, again, we're happy to do a one-on-one -on -one and answer those. Uh, another question here, uh, given uh, market preferences, uh, are we uh, already moving our portfolio in the direction uh, or are we staying in cash for now? We are moving our, our current portfolios. Uh, we are moving them around a little bit. Uh, it's not a static uh, bar right now trying to take advantage of some of the, uh, the, the up days, uh, but all in the general, um, the general theme right now is, is still cash. Uh, cash is king. Uh, and as I mentioned, we do expect another pullback, uh, despite what we've seen this week uh, from, the, uh, from the markets uh, being in the positives. 
we uh, we do expect there to be another pullback, another buying opportunity, and also just give us a little bit more um, view into uh, where the markets are headed and when they're going to come out of this. Because we haven't, we, as, as I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> the rally is kind of uh, is kind of speculation because we haven't seen any changes in the underlying economic situation. The, the, the stores haven't reopened, the, the, the business, have, in fact, we're seeing more and more closed, different as the states one by one uh, are closing down. Uh, so we're seeing more and more closures and uh, no openings yet. So <clears throat> I wouldn't say it's time to jump in yet because we, we, we don't really see that runway of, of when they're gonna open. And of course, the longer they stay closed, the more and more businesses won't survive. Uh, no matter how healthy the business is, uh, staying closed um, and still incurring costs, they all have an expiry date that they, they can't go beyond. Some, of course, have a long uh, runway uh, and, and other ones have a much, much shorter uh, time frame that they can survive without being open or without having income. So uh, that is, we need to have a little bit more clarity around that. And that's why we look to China and we're seeing them opening. And if we look at that timeline, we probably won't see the openings really ha start happening until May, late May, maybe June, uh, assuming we would follow the same uh, time periods as what we saw in China. Uh, and in that case, um, we probably won't deploy um, the bulk of the cash until uh, at least early mid-May uh, when, when we can see that we have bottomed in the market and we do see things coming out of it or, or, or at least potential of things coming out. Uh, so we're watching, as I mentioned in the previous one, we're really watching the U.S. Uh, as the COVID uh, spreads um, because until they plateau, uh, we really won't be close until, um, we'll be close to reopening the economy down there. Uh, a couple of other questions um, and then I'll let everyone go for this week. Uh, alternatives, uh, alternative investing. Um, so alternative investing is sometimes called hedge funds. Alternative is the new name after uh, hedge funds got blown up a little bit and people got turned off the idea of the hedge fund. Uh, we just came out with the name uh, alternative. So alternatives uh, generally invest into uh, private companies and or uh, what we call long shorts, which means that they can take, um, they can take an investment that uh, benefits when the markets go down. Um, they're, they're definitely a great strategy to have in the portfolios as hedges, uh, as part of your diversification. Uh, but I wouldn't be looking at them right now. Uh, they tend to be less liquid, uh, even though some of them, uh, in just in the last six months, the regulatory body, uh, approve what we call liquid alts. Uh, so it means they have uh, much more liquidity than the previous ones, but uh, their holdings inside aren't very liquid. Uh, even though they hold cash to, uh, to provide that liquidity um, to investors, uh, the underlying performance uh, is going to be challenged because the, they will have to liquidate some of the less liquid uh, holdings to keep the cash levels up as people sell. Uh, and uh, that means they might have to sell uh, things at very unfavorable prices uh, because the less liquid it is, sometimes you have to reduce your price in order to get uh, a buyer interested. So not something like I'd be looking at added in portfolio. If you had in your portfolio pr uh, previously, uh, definitely worth uh, re-examining. Um, there's all the flavors of Baskin Robbins when it comes to alts and, and some would be good right now and, and others might be challenged. So uh, we could look at some direct names, but I would definitely uh, keep those in mind. Um, and the Bank of Canada rates, uh, do we think we're going to, they are going to go negative? Uh, no, uh, no, we don't. Um, I think the, both the U S and Canada, they slashed their rates uh, to nearly zero um, or effectively zero. Uh, I, I don't think they would go the negative route. It wouldn't make sense for the economies. Uh, they would just print more money. Of course, that brings in inflation uh, concerns, uh, but they would pr very likely use uh, that tool in their kit prior to going to negative rates. So, uh, so we don't think we'll go that route. Um, I think that's it for questions for this week. So uh, thank you everyone for joining us. 
we will uh, we will do one of these again next week and again watch your mailbox if you uh, are interested in the tax one as uh, we all get to uh, file our taxes over the next couple months uh, with the extension to June 1st uh, and uh, I hope you are all well and staying safe uh, and again as always reach out if you have any questions or any concerns uh, we're happy to do a one-on-one -on -one call or uh, a, a video call thank you all take care